As we've followed BC wine growers, we've witnessed bud break, flowering, and braise on. Now it's fall and time for the main event, Harvest 2021. Our focus is how wine growers process four varieties, each requiring different methods of handling, with stops at Mount Boucherie and Spearhead wineries near Kelowna, Moraine Winery on the Naramata Bench, and Asoya Space La Stella, where we begin with winemaker Severin Pint and her team in the midst of a Merlot pick. And that is the vineyard that was just picked today. My stuzzle. So today we picked the Merlot at La Stella, and the reason we picked it is that when I uh, take the berry, um, I went in the vineyard uh, yesterday and then took the berry and then um, put them in my mouth and then I tasted the skins and the seeds and um, they, the skins are crunchy, I have awesome flavors, the pulp is uh, detaching from the seeds very easily and um, double check with some uh, analysis and we are pH about 3.5 24-25 bricks, so it tells me this is ready for picking. I don't want to, something to be overripe, so that's what we did. So we picked this morning, we picked in a one quarter ton bin, like this, and uh, we've been uh, processing uh, all day. At La Stella, the Merlot grapes are dropped into the open-top fermentation tanks below. As the Merlot soaks and begins to ferment, the skins float to the surface forming a cap that needs to be submerged beneath the juice occasionally to continue extracting color, flavor and tannins. Here we go, we have the open top. So the open top fermenter we're using here at the Stella for the Meister block. It's a very small continent, as you can see here. Uh, it allows us to work the grapes uh, very gently. And so what we're going to do, we're going to crunch down. So that tool here that's sticking out, uh, I'm going to use it to um, uh, push the grapes down. And um, I will uh, very gently extract. So the, gra the grapes that we picked this morning are very ripe. And I don't want to over extract. I don't want to extract those harsh tannins. Um, so we're going to do a very gentle extraction. So I can uh, show how we're going to do that uh, crunch down. So here we go. We have the juice. I have my tool. And I'm going to crunch down. One end crunch down. Pint that. demonstrates a punch down with one hand for the camera, but normally it's a two-handed technique that requires a lot of effort. The very beginning, when there's no alcohol, it's maybe twice a day. And as soon as there's uh, too much alcohol, like around mid-fermentation, we're going to slow down because I don't want to extract too harsh tannins. And it will go in a, probably uh, one new barrel. We're about going to have about 600 liters. So one new barrel, and then after that, uh, two other barrels are going to be um, that have already had one or two wines in it. And, uh, so the new barrel is standing behind me, behind me. Behind me. Tight, a bit tight, 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 tight. And, uh, and, and, uh, we go. and we'll age there for we'll about uh, 18 for months. months. And then we'll bottle it and then you guys can taste it. I would say that uh, on the blocks where we were able to uh, keep the plant happy during uh, the heat wave, we have very, very good quality grapes. Uh, perfect balance. The berries are a normal size, so it's good. After, there's some blocks where the heat um, did some damage and the berries are small, so the phenologic maturity are not on par. So those blocks are going to be fixed separately. Uh, but so far, what we have picked, Muscat, Sauvignon Blanc, uh, and then the Melo today, it's excellent. Punch downs are one way to achieve color and flavor in your wine. Another path is carbonic maceration, where the fermentation begins inside the grapes. It's commonly used with Gamay and Beaujolais. We were fortunate that winemaker Jeff Huntermark was processing Gamay using this rare technique at Mount Boucherie in West Kelowna. So what we're doing is uh, setting up the, the ferment for a carbonic maceration. The, uh, we don't add any yeast, it's not, the berries aren't crushed. 
the berries are whole. So when the uh, fermentation takes place, it's an intercellular fermentation, meaning that inside those grapes, the, uh, the cells feed on sugar, then they start to create a little bit of alcohol, a little bit of CO2. So now that we've got the grapes a whole cluster into this bin, we're going to add uh, a layer of CO2. So I just got some dry ice, which I'll kind of sprinkle around inside. I don't want to put too much in there because I don't want to drop the temperature. It's actually really cold dry ice. And we're going to seal it right up. And it's ready to go down the cellar. From the crush pad, we moved to the cellar to taste a tank of Gamay that was already in the midst of its carbonic fermentation, yielding amazingly fresh primary fruit aromas and the bright red colors that bleed from inside of the grape out. So it doesn't look any different than, uh, than it does at the beginning, which is the real key to this. We don't want it to be overly juicy. We just want it to be full clusters and, um, and you know, getting all that flavor from the skins. That's the, uh, that's the key to this. So if you were, if this was smell-o-vision, <laughs> you'd be able to smell the CO2 coming off of here. It's very, very strong smelling. It means that there's a layer of CO2 formed inside this, uh, this bin, which is great. And after about a week, these berries will actually just explode. They'll actually explode, the juice will be released, and we, we know it's ready to, uh, to do traditional fermentation at that point. So this one is pretty close. You can see the, uh, the color is starting to come through in the, in the pulp, which coming from the skin, which is really neat, and that's the, be the best part of it. The really neat thing, though, is the flavors. So it really picks up a lot of strawberry, raspberry flavors, the, um, uh, the esters. It's very an estral uh, way of making wine, uh, picking up lots of uh, flavors, uh, very ripe red, red fruit flavors. From West Kelowna, we made our way to the Mid-Okanagan Valley and its famed Naramata Bench. Winemaker Dwight Sick is processing Viognier and he highlights just how much pressure this time of the season can exert on wine growers. Nerves narrow along with harvesting windows that could make or break every wine if you make the wrong decision. It's, it's the, like, the equivalent, I would say, of like Pinot Noir. It's, it's the heartbreak of the white grapes. Um, it's either underripe or overripe. So the window of opportunity is very, very specific to get it just right. So typically you'll start looking at chemistry numbers, but then you'll forget all about them. And it's just based on the flavor profile that you're seeing in the vineyard. And you pick as soon as that you hit that flavor profile you're looking for. It's a grape that really likes the environment here because it's, it's kind of, I, I refer to this frequently, but it's kind of the Goldilocks of the valley. It's not too hot, it's not too cool. And so we're able to actually fully physiologically ripen Viognier without losing the precious acidity that we're, it's so important in that grape. It, it has a tendency to fall off very quickly in warmer environments. And so we have the ability to preserve that here. Um, when, when we decide it's time to pick here, it's, it's all a state fruit, it's hand picked. Um, we do our first sort in the vineyard, so anything that doesn't make the grade is dropped in the vineyard. Uh, the fruit is full cluster, loaded into the press and very gently pressed. We don't include any of the, uh, the hard press cycle whatsoever into this wine. Um, we'll actually have another use for the hard press and it goes completely to a different, to different wine. There's a lot of very simple wines that are made from Viognier that I kind of compare to kind of peaches and cream style. Um, they're very juicy and lush. The acids are very low. There's typically some residual sugar left into the wine that makes them very consumer friendly. Um, the direction we go at Moraine is a little more austere. We, we go drier on the palate. They're food driven wines. Um, they're more really a white wine for a red wine drinker. You know, it's just approaching the Thanksgiving weekend and uh, we're just over 50% in on our harvest. Um, overall, I would say yields are down slightly. Some grapes are coming in pretty much on target of what we expected, but the vast majority of the clusters with the heat wave that we experienced this year are coming in 
much smaller berries and lighter clusters. So overall, I think you'll see in the valley that over generalizations, it'll be anywhere from 25 to 30 percent down this year. From Moraine, we head north about 40 kilometers as the crow flies to East Kelowna, high above Lake Okanagan. Winemaker Grant Stanley is processing Pinot Noir and reveals a prime benefit of true, cool climate BC when it comes to harvesting Pinot grapes and performing cold soap. We started here on Monday. A big wall of uh, Pinot Noir and Pinot Gris has been arriving daily since then from uh, the southern vineyards. And uh, you know, so far so good. If anything, I would say that uh, the, there's, a, there's a fair bit of raisining in some of the Pinot, which is uh, one of the most desirable things you can have with Pinot Noir. You get about five or 10% raisining, you get a really nice kind of flavor and sugar and acid pop. Also, uh, you know, the berry size is particularly small this year, which isn't great for the grower, but it's certainly good for me. You get sort of like a, almost a Christmas cakey kind of character with some of those raisins, like Amarone, if you like. Um, but certainly a, a slightly smaller crop down there. Things are coming in here at Spearhead a little bit slower because uh, picking, getting pickers this year has been a real challenge, a real challenge for everybody. The, the great thing about harvesting late at this time of year is not only do you get you know, genuine ripeness, real genuine skin ripeness, uh, particularly you know, where, where that matters with Pinot Noir, but you also get free refrigeration. The fruit's coming in super chilled already on the vine, and so you haven't got the threat of fermentation coming at you, and you can sit things on skins and hold them for pretty much as long as you like. So now we're going to have a quick look at something that we've had here sitting on the deck here outside with some free refrigeration. And you see we have lots and lots of de-stemmed fruit, de-stemmed berries soaking away on skins. And underneath that, there's about 20%, 10 or 15 to 20% of whole bunches in there uh, as well. And this is going to be here for, you know, up to a week before we move it inside. And once we move it inside, we'll be warming it up um, and kicking off fermentation. All of the fermentation here at Spearhead and most of the work that I do is spontaneous which doesn't necessarily mean that it's wild yeast, but that it's a variety of yeasts that are kind of present here in the winery. And we allow whichever one to sort of take hold and, and take over just by virtue of the fact that we're kind of warming them, warming the, the bat and so that the yeast then have an opportunity to take hold. Um, you know, one of the things about the, with Pinot Noir is that we do have to be careful about the alcohol level because the wines are very subtle. Um, meaning that uh, they don't have a, a huge amount of tannin and structure and so the alcohol can sort of poke out and uh, be, you know not be be something you want and I would say anything above sort of 14 13 5 for me is a sweet spot as long as there's lots of, of power in the wine that can carry that alcohol despite its northern position British Columbia Pinot Noir offers a surprising range of colors as it goes through the fermentation and aging process the notion of extracting color in an aqueous solution versus alcohol has changed the game for New World Pinot producers. Funnily enough, the one that looks like the red wine is actually the rosé. And this will give you an idea, when we soak Pinot Noir on skins for two days, we have this color here, the rosé. But after it's gone through process, it ends up, you know, a little more like this. Um, so we're starting off with a fair bit of color and then we just work our way back from there. Uh, the other one is the 667 here and that is basically, you know, being on skins for about three days. Um, and so you're not seeing a heck of a lot of color there yet. Um, the extraction is pretty light. And then over here, just this kind of paley peachy one is 667 as well. Um, and again, that's only a couple of days on skins. So. What we see is like really about day six and day seven, we start to see really, you know, color coming on a little more aggressively. And that's why, that's when we sort of decide to bring things inside and warm them up and get things rolling at that point. Um, but definitely day by day by day, the color becomes richer and richer and richer. Um, and uh, you can start seeing a lot of purple, a lot of purple coming out towards the, uh, the end of the cold, so a lot of purple hue. This slice of harvest highlights the many decisions BC wine growers face, which can have punishing consequences. All that said, the many varieties in a relatively tiny wine region speaks to the diversity of British Columbia wine and ultimately, along with the people, adds to the complexity and story of each bottle.